Well, good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here this morning. I'm going to open up in a word of prayer. Please join me. Lord, we are grateful for this day. We are grateful how your mercies are new every morning that you refresh us. Um, in the middle of this semester, as it begins, Lord, help us to make time for you to be thinking about the personhood of Jesus Christ and how we can model that in our daily walks and who we are running into, Lord, the ministry of people that you've given to us. Bless this morning. Bless us from your word, through prayer, through worship, Lord, through community and fellowship. We thank you for all these amazing things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite us all to stand this morning. Let's sing together. again the chorus
Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. The Lord of all. The Lord of all. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's have a seat. It's a blessing this morning to be with you all. As you can see this morning, we have the Eastern University Choir along with us, along with some members of the chapel worship team. And it's just been a blessing to work with everyone this morning. So we're going to present a song for you. I know it's a little early for something more wintry, even dare I say the word Christmas. But we're going to sing something. We're working on that. We've got to think months ahead. So this song here is called African Noel. And it's a really simple song, but it's very powerful. We really hope you enjoy it. Stay seated, and we're going to sing together a hymn. If you would please take your eyes at the monitor, we're going to have our PowerPoint this morning, and we're going to be singing together in the garden. This is a very well-known hymn, and Dr. Tony Campolo this morning is helping us out by making these recommendations. So let's all sing together in the garden. Tells me I 
for our next piece, we're going to feature our select ensemble called Turning Point. We're going to sing a song called He Never Failed Me Yet. Yeah. 
We're going to close this morning's set by singing a hymn together. I'd ask us all to stand, and we're going to sing together a hymn called How Firm a Foundation. Let's sing this together. Before you take a seat, let's take a moment this morning and greet those that are around us. Let's take a few moments. Good morning. We want to thank Professor Derek Kosovich and you, uh, the University Choir and Turning Point for leading us this morning in worship. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. We want to welcome you. If you're watching on live stream uh, this morning, we do have people actually watching Chapel Live on live stream. We want to welcome you. We want to welcome any visitors. If you're here, especially today, uh, to hear our chapel speaker, we welcome you. You're welcome here at Eastern University. And also a special welcome to cohort 12 of the PhD program, our organizational leadership. We are glad you're here. I had the opportunity to connect with them on Monday and to see Dr. Greenhalgh and Ellie, welcome to you also. We're grateful that you're here. Um, as you know, this is a very special day because we have two of our patron saints with us today, Peggy and Tony Campolo. I'm going to introduce the actual patron saint who will be speaking, but I also uh, want to let you know that it's also uh, special because of someone I've known all my life has a birthday today, and we, we usually don't do this in chapel, 
but I've known her all her lot my life, and um, since I'm the university chaplain, I have this authority to do things. <laughs> I just want to give a shout out on this day to my sister, Dr. Maria Ficarra's birthday today. I know she's out there, and I know I don't want to embarrass her. But... No. And a few other gifts here, but we're not going to um, interrupt Dr. Campola's sample uh, message here. But congratulations, Maria. Congratulations. Happy birthday to you. So this morning's chapel speaker has often been referred to as the patron saint of Eastern University. I'm often reminded of G.K. Chesterton's definition of what a saint is. A saint is someone who exaggerates what the world neglects. When I arrived 25 years ago at the university, I met with Dr. Campola's administrative assistant at the time, Marge O'Connor, who gave me the following gift that I've had in my office for the last 25 years, and I took a special look at it just the other day. It's actually a little figurine of Dr. Campolo. <laughs> now, I do not worship the figurine. I worship Jesus the Christ, but I keep it on my bookshelf. Now, listen to this. Um, look, take a look. If you notice where he's been standing for the last 25 years on one side of it is Richard Forster's book, The Spiritual Classics. Maybe you can see that. And on the other side is a book on the historical Jesus. What a, what a wonderful way to summarize the life and legacy of Dr. Tony Campola. Would you please welcome our patron saint, Dr. Tony Campola. Eastern is an incredibly avant-garde institution. And uh, when it comes to the feminist movement, we've been at the vanguard. We were one of the first schools to ever introduce women's studies here at Eastern. It's been done. Uh, we have been at cutting edge in thinking on this issue. It's important for us to recognize that because often the church has not been at the vanguard. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has been one of the cutting edge persons when it comes to the whole issue of uh, women's rights. We've done a great deal about trying to correct some of the inequities of the past, championing the women's rights movement. It should be noted that it's part of our evangelical heritage. Back in the 1800s, in the early 1800s, when no one was talking about women's rights, the Billy Graham of the era, who was a man named Charles Finney, advocated women's rights. And the first, the first meetings of the feminist movement were held in Wesleyan churches in the Niagara area of New York. There's something deeper than just rights that need to be dealt with here. There is something about our society, our Western society, that has socialized us to suppress anything feminine. Indeed, it was Carl Jung, for those who are psych majors, who pointed out that we are all unbalanced because the culture has forced women to suppress certain traits because they were thought to be men's traits, being assertive, being strong, standing up and being bold. Women were taught to suppress that. Men, on the other hand, as Carl Jung points out, have been taught to suppress certain masculine traits. We are not supposed to cry even though Jesus wept. We are supposed to uh, be forthright, uh, but uh, on the other hand, we are, we are told to not be gentle and sweet, even though Jesus was gentle and sweet. As a matter of fact, Carl Jung was quick to point out that Jesus 
is perhaps the only person in Western history and in world history who has had the perfect balance between masculinity and femininity. If you're looking for somebody that's tough, look to Jesus. In a masculine sense, he's tough. I mean, he goes to his hometown, Nazareth, and he preaches, and it's an amazing situation because the crowd rises up against him, grabs him, takes him to the edge of town, and is about to throw him over the cliff when Jesus turns on the mob. I have only had to face a mob once in my life, and I was so frightened. I mean, to have a mob coming at you to destroy you, I actually wet my pants. I, I, I'm ashamed of that, but I, I was afraid. Jesus wasn't afraid. When the mob pressed in on him, the Bible says that he turns on the mob. It's an incredible passage of scripture. And he walks straight at this angry mob that is there to destroy him. And he walks through the midst of them. I mean, this is a scene that makes John Wayne look weak by comparison. The crowd splits. And Jesus passes through the midst of them. And no one dares lay a hand on him. What was there about Jesus that even an angry mob would have to stand back and split and not move towards him? There was something incredibly masculine about that. And just when you're ready to put him in a super male box, he turns around and says to his disciples, hey, fellas, have you noticed the lilies? Have you noticed how beautiful they are? So feminine, as he says, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. This Jesus, who could be so tough in the face of a mob, and not only in face of a mob, uh, when I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in the Wharton School of Business and Finance, I, uh, most of my students were Jewish, and I loved to tell them about the time that Jesus went into the temple and turned over the tables. They estimate that there were at least 300 people selling stuff in the holy place. And, and I would say to my students, any guy who could take on 300 Jewish businessmen single-handedly that's tough. That's tough. And yet he could turn around and say, let the little children come unto me. Let them sit on my lap. For as such is the kingdom of God. Jesus, the perfect balance between male and female. Carl Jung says we will never be healthy until the men in our society are able to recover the female side of their personhood. And vice versa, will never be healthy until the women are able to recover the masculine side of their humanity. For our culture has socialized us to suppress part of what would make us totally human. The motto of Eastern, it's a great motto. The whole gospel for the whole world. Jesus came to make us whole, to help us to recover those aspects of what it means to be human, that the culture has socialized us to suppress. As of late, the guru on secular university campuses, the man that they look to as articulating the ethos that we should in fact embrace, is a writer named uh, Jordan Peterson. His books are now bestsellers. He's talked about in the secular world. Uh, I don't know that the Christian world has caught up to Jordan Peterson, but interestingly enough, Jordan Peterson, the hero of the secular culture, is actually a Christian. He acknowledges that he is such. And he says that the Western culture has lost something that the Asian culture never did lose. They had this balance between what he called the yin and the yang. The yin and the yang. Uh, the symbol of that is on the Korean flag. It's a circle. There's a line down the middle. The dark side is yin. The light side is yang. And you're never whole, say the Chinese philosophers, as says Jesus, until you're balanced between the two, yin and yang. 
Let me just say that the characteristics of yin and yang need to be spelled out, according to Peterson. Yin is very person-oriented. Yang is very principle-oriented. We need a balance between the two. Let me say that not too far from here, where many years ago, there was a thing called the Valley Forge Music Fair. And you could go and see Broadway shows at the Valley Forge Music Fair without having to go into the city. A friend of mine was going to the Valley Forge Music Fair. Now, we're middle class people out here in the suburbs. And middle class people never arrive early and they strive not to be late. So 15 minutes before the program starts, very few people are present. They all arrive at the same time. They don't want to be late. And so it was that my friend driving his car into the parking lot at the Valley Forge Music Fair is confronted by the guy who says, Mr., uh, I, I need 50 cents for you to park here. My friend whipped out his newspaper and showed the attendant in the newspaper where it says, free parking. See, it says, free parking. The attendant says, it's a donation. I'm, I'm, I don't like that, you know, to go to the Philadelphia Art Museum it's free, people, and when you try to get in, they say, but there's a $4 donation. My friend said, I gave at the office. I'm not donating anything. He said, mister, don't give me a hard time. You don't give me the 50 cents. You don't park here. Do you understand? At that, my friend said, that's okay by me, but I'm not giving you the 50 cents. He rolled up his windows, turned off the ignition, his car is blocking the only entrance to the parking lot. <laughs> Cars are backed up in both directions on 202. He's holding firm. People have rolled down their windows and are shouting things at him. Yay, he was being lambasted. They were saying all manner of evil against him falsely. <laughs> He's standing his ground. People are screaming and yelling at him. In the meantime, his wife has crawled under the dashboard and she's yelling at him, give him the 50 cents. It's a lousy 50 cents. Everybody's looking at us. Note her emphasis, people. People are angry with us. People are screaming at us. And you know his response. It's not the 50 cents, it's the, it's the principle of the thing. And so he's principle-oriented, she's person-oriented. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus is both person-oriented and principle-oriented. The woman comes with, uh, to him, he's thrown at, at his feet. The woman caught in adultery, and they say she has committed adultery. She has violated the principles of the Mosaic law. And you know what we're supposed to do with those who violate the principle? They are to be stoned to death. And Jesus looks at this woman, this pathetic woman, weeping, frightened, trembling, and he has compassion. He's sensitive to this person. And he says to the Pharisees who, and the priests who have surrounded him, let the one who is without sin throw the first stone. He is full of grace. He's full of empathy. He's full of sensitivity to the sufferings of this woman. One by one, the accusers disappear. And Jesus says, as you know to this woman, where are thine accusers? And they've all gone. Neither do I accuse thee. Grace, grace, grace. And then he says, go thy way. And then he reaffirms the principle, and sin no more. I'm showing you grace, but don't think I'm minimizing the principle. Don't think I'm minimizing the rule. Jesus is able to be sensitive to persons who suffer, and at the same time, he, he holds up rules. In politics today, we need that balance. When I look to our southern border and I see what's going on as these refugees try to come into the country, I can stand with Donald Trump, 
who says we just can't open our borders and not know who's coming in. There are drug pushers from Colombia. There are rapists and murderers who are coming across the border. He's right. You cannot, in fact, simply open up the border and let everybody who wants to come in, come in. There has to be some rules. There has to be some regulations. We have to vent people. We have to know who's coming into the country. But people, there's something terribly wrong with children in cages. There's something terribly wrong with mothers crying and screaming because they've been separated from their children. There has to be some sensitivity to persons, even as we uphold rules. There needs to be balance. That's what we want, balance. In politics, the Democrats would make it for open borders. The Republicans, on the other hand, would be mean at the border and say, stay out of here, we have no room for you. The truth is we need balance between the two. I gave the dedicatory prayer when, when Clinton was, was giving over the Clinton Library in Little Rock, Arkansas. I, I had the dedicatory prayer and, and just before I spoke he said this. The Democrats and the Republicans need each other. Behind him were the two Bush presidents and Jimmy Carter, both parties represented at this occasion. He said the Democrats and the Republicans need each other. The Republicans draw lines that should not be crossed. The Democrats erase lines that should have never existed. Stop to think about that. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for, the, for the liberals the feminist movement would have never gotten off the ground if it wasn't for the liberals. Racism would not be challenged. And yet, if it wasn't for the conservatives, there would be no constraints on society, there would be no rules. There needs to be balance between the two. I'm for the two-party system because they represent two important things. Empathy for persons on the one hand a necessity for rules and regulations and restraints on the other. If we go too far in the rules direction, persons are hurt. If we go too far in the person direction, we, we lose something. We need the balance between the two. We can't have open borders on the one hand. On the other hand, these are refugees. These are people who are frightened, who are trying to flee from those who would kill them. There's got to be some heart here. There has to be some empathy. And there's no room for putting kids in cages while their mothers weep and mourn. We need some balance out there between the yin and the yang. Another differentiation between yin and yang is that uh, when we come to the doctrine of salvation, yin is into doctrine. You're a Christian if you believe the right things. I remember when I went down the aisle to accept Jesus, I got in the back room and they asked me, do you believe that Jesus is the incarnation of God? I said, yes. Do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? I said, yes. Do you believe that on judgment day, the Lord will have given over all of your sins on the shoulders of Jesus and you will be spotless? And Yes, I believe in that. You believe all these things? I said, yes. Then you're a Christian. And I knew there was something more than that. I wanted to feel something. I wanted to feel Jesus. I wanted to, I wanted to feel him invading me. I wanted to feel his presence within me. Yes, we do need firm doctrine, but we need the experience. So the Calvinists and the Lutherans came along in the Protestant Reformation and said, our theology needs to be straightened out. Here are the things that we should believe, and we thank God for them. And then along came Wesley, and the whole Wesleyan revival, who said it's important to have our doctrine straight and solid, but, but do you have a relationship? Do you have a relationship with the resurrected Jesus? It's one thing to believe that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. That's a good doctrine. It's an essential doctrine. But the real question says, 
Wesley is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Do you feel him? Do you connect with him? Is he a person to you? Is it just a lot of doctrines? Is that what your Christianity is about? A statement of faith, a Chalcedonian creed, a, a, an apostle's creed? Or do you have this relationship where Jesus is not just a doctrine, but a person, and you feel him. The hymn we sang today, he walks with me, he talks with me, and he tells me I am an o his own. That is so yin, so person-oriented. And yet, we had balance today in chapel. We also sang, how firm a foundation, our faith in the Lord. There was doctrine on the one hand, there was an emotional connectedness on the other. People, you need both of those things to be a Christian. I don't want a Christianity that's just a lot of emotion. I don't want a Christianity that is only doctrine. I want balance between the yin and the yang. And the greatness of the Christian faith is we worship a God who in Jesus Christ is perfectly balanced. He is the complete human being. And he invites you to surrender to him so that he can make you into a complete human being. A person who knows the yin and the yang, who knows how to be sensitive to persons on the one hand and to be principled on the other. One last thing, the yin and the yang. The yin is very connected to this world, very uh, connected to the personal needs of people in this world. Yang, on the other hand, tends to be focused on the next world. I grew up in a masculine culture, in a yang culture. Christianity for me was about getting ready to die for the next world. Are you ready? If you were to die today, would you be ready to face your maker? Man, uh, Jonathan Edwards preached that incredible sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jeez. <laughs> scared the daylights out of people. He got people down the aisle by getting them scared. Hell fire and brimstone he preached you're going to be punished judgment day is coming whoa whoa that's one way of getting them down the aisle but there's another way of getting them down the aisle it's by singing softly and tenderly jesus is calling come home come home sinners come home we need both of those things and when it comes to dealing with poverty, which is a major concern right now, we need on the one hand to change the political and economic structures that make people poor. On the other hand, we need to reach out to people who are in need. Here at Eastern, we have a balance between the two. Over there, there's a table, and it's our graduate program in a third world economic development. You want to help the poor? You ought to support a child through compassion or through world vision. And if you're not doing it, you should. There should be at least one kid out there that you've rescued from poverty and despair. On the other hand, if you're going to address poverty, you must not only respond on a personal level, you must become part of a movement to change the structures of society. And that's what this master's pro We're one of the few schools in the world where you can study that. I don't know what you're going to do after graduation, you seniors, but before you leave, you ought to go over to the table and get information about the graduate programs and find out how Eastern is striving not only to get you to support kids on an individualistic basis, but to train a generation of young men and women who will go out to change the world, the political and economic structures that make people poor. Bishop Romano, Romano in, in Latin America was confronted by some Christian leaders who say, uh, you're a saint. He said, when I feed hungry children, they call me a saint. When I ask them how the political and economic system has made them poor, they call me a communist. People, we need to change the system. We need to respond to persons. We need the balance between the yin and the yang. Today, I invite you to surrender your life to Jesus to enter into a relationship with Jesus. If you do, he will change you and make you into a whole person. Be honest. You're a Christian here today. 
but there's something missing in your life. Invite Jesus to invade you and to create the balance and make you into a whole person so that when you leave Eastern, you'll be a whole person and you'll seek to bring the whole gospel to the whole world. Pray with me. Father God, make us into sensitive persons who care, who are emotionally connected, who are very yin in that respect. But Lord, make us into principled people who stand for truth, who articulate doctrine with precision, who know how to give a reason for the faith that lies within us. We thank you that you don't just tell us what to do. You present yourself. And as we invite you to be in our lives, you transform us and you complete us and help us to recover those aspects of our humanity that the culture has socialized us to change. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and you're dismissed.